So Matt, it's been a while. How are you? What have you been up to? Uh, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, I've had a busy few weeks since we spoke last. Uh, What have I done? Well, first big thing is I've got a part-time job. Really? Yeah. I got back from visiting family uh, about a month ago and all the news about energy bills this winter and like... Mm. How am I going to find a few thousand pounds more when I actually want to be saving a few thousand pounds to build a workshop? Uh, So there was a new restaurant bar opening in town. Uh, If people don't know, I'm a trained chef and worked as a chef for 20 years before becoming a woodworker. I mean, there was a transition period, but I dropped them a message, went in, and uh, I'm now my third week there in the kitchen working evenings not every evening a few evenings a week in the kitchen oh wow you enjoying it well as it's a new opening it's been very stressful all i wanted is just a job as in i just want to turn up do my work go home type of thing the trouble is i I had an interview and then they got me back in then literally the night before it opened they had no kitchen staff whatsoever I asked, do you have any food? No. And so I went in the kitchen, seeing the menu for the first time, went through the fridges, wrote out all the ingredients they would need for tomorrow, then came in and prepped the entire menu on my own, working like a 14-hour shift, and did all the cooking on the first couple of nights uh, on my own before I got like this 24-year-old girl who's a chef come in on the third night. And now I've kind of been working with her for over a week to train her up to be head chef so my idea of oh i just want to do my shifts went to oh i'm running the kitchen oh my god i say i hope it calms down i hope to just do three evenings a week preferably say friday saturday sunday night so it really doesn't affect what i do but yeah. the mo- but the moment it's been hugely affecting what i do so i've been at the house 10 months now my clothes are still in boxes. I decorated the guest room so because I had uh, friends come and stay and family come and stay, so I wanted to make that nice. My room's a stay. <laughs> I don't know what I want to do, probably build it, built in wardrobes at some point, but I just want to hang my clothes up. I thought, I'll make a simple clothes rail. And so I've been working on a couple of A-frames to do that. And the fourth housing joint, I cut on the wrong side this week. Oh. And it's like, just such a stupid mistake, but I'm, I've got like a few hours before work and I went to bed at three in the morning because you work late, but then you're buzzing and you've got to unwind. So it's just, mm. it's a nightmare. And with my workshop set up, as I'm sure you can appreciate, like I use the table saw, I cut all the bits on that. And then I put the table saw back in the house. And yeah. of course, you need the table saw just to recut this bit and that. So you just, it's going through all the stages again. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of a nightmare doing both at the moment. But so I'm really looking forward to things calming down and actually enjoy doing a project rather than the I've got to do a project and I've only got so much time yeah I hate working like that as I'm sure you do definitely but I know you've been hugely busy and like that recently haven't you it's been a very different couple of weeks for me because obviously the the main priority has been all of our roofing work that's going on with our bungalow um, we've had some real highs and lows throughout that <laughs> the low point was when we went away for four days and our cat sitter called to say that there were puddles of water on our bathroom floor. I called the roofer, he came over, said he'd sorted it out. So I thought that was the end of it. But then on the way home, fairly long drive home from Skegness, the rain was just incredible. I've never seen anything like it. It was so heavy um, while we were driving home and I was just thinking to myself, oh my God, I hope everything's all right at home. Got in, looked in the bathroom, it's dry. It's like, oh, brilliant. I can see that water has got in at some point, but it's dry today, so that means the leak is fixed. So we got on with our day after that. Uh, a little bit later, went and sat down on the sofa, looked up at the ceiling um, in the living room, which is a room that our cat sitter had no reason to go into, so she wouldn't have known or seen it. The whole ceiling was absolutely soaked. Um, there was a damp smell, musty kind of plastery smell. A few hours later, because it was still raining, so it was, it was continually raining throughout the day, so things were just getting worse and worse, and I was conscious that obviously I needed to get up into the loft to strip out all of the insulation because it would have been soaking wet in, in the loft and 
heavy on the plasterboard yeah weighing it down um but yeah a couple of hours later we looked up at the ceiling and this massive crack had appeared right across the ceiling i was worried about it sort of collapsing i just wasn't in the right frame of mind to doing anything about it so i i just kind of had to ignore it overnight plus it was con- it was still raining anyway so it just didn't feel it felt like an uphill struggle to do anything about it at that point in time so i left it till the next day and it's a dry day i went up there just pulled out all of the insulation which was just you know it had soaked up water like a sponge had to put it all in buckets throw it all away only about six months after actually insulating the loft as well mm. so it was all brand new insulation that just a lot of it just had to be thrown away there was some insulation that was just a little bit damp so i kind of peeled that back in the hope that after time you know it'll dry out and be reusable um basically what happened is one of the lads that works for the roofer hadn't tucked in the membrane underneath the felt on a flat roof that's at the top of our bungalow so there was just an area where it was just getting in and you could see the water running down the the roof joists Uh, and it's just devastating really because obviously we've only decorated everything a couple of years ago and also because water has to travel downwards so not only was it in the loft and there were pools of water sitting on top of the plasterboard but it was you could also see a point where it's coming down the wall and all the paint on the wall had bubbled off and yeah lots of repairs to do and is he apologetic and gonna put this right he's been very apologetic to be honest i get on really well with him he's he's one of the better tradesmen that i've dealt with he's mm. he's just a really nice guy he's genuine you know he's a man of his word what i basically did was said we either want it sorted by some professionals or um i'll do the work and but this is the amount of money i would want to do it i, I almost like i priced it up as a job yeah if i was going to be doing it for some right. else yeah so i figured you know a, a ceiling repair rake out all of the crack fill it all repaint it all i've got to get rid of all the brown water stains as well so going to need to bleach the water stains primer like a seal primer like a zinza primer or something that's horrible stuff to use as well it is yeah and then new insulation as well and then my time to do all of that work which i figure is going to be the best part of a day so getting rid of all the materials yeah although luckily there's still a skip outside so all of the insulation went in there oh that's Um, but yeah it will get resolved it's just a little bit devastating yeah that was obviously the real low point but then the high point was um, Robin Clevett coming over to to help build the pitched roof, which was just unbelievable. And I, I've been getting sort of loads of messages on Instagram saying, "How on earth did you get Robin to come all the way to Norfolk to help you?" Mm. And I'm like, "I don't, I don't really know." I mean, he offered. I I asked him for some advice about seven or eight months ago about the roof, and he basically signed off the email with. Let me know when you want to do it. I'll come up and help you. It's like, what? And um, I haven't really said anything about it to anyone because I was just, you know, is, is this really going to happen? It seems too good to be true kind of thing. But sure enough, he showed up with his... Uh, apprentice seems uh, like the wrong term because Ed, who works with Robin, is, you know, a fully-fledged carpenter in his own right. He's, mm. he's fantastically skilled and very talented. Yeah, they they did an incredible job it was just it was amazing watching them work and the pace at which they work so ed's kind of turning the timber over ready for rob robin to make the cuts and you can just tell that they've already built up this kind of synergy with each other in terms of knowing what each other wants and expects from each other and it's just like a well-oiled machine it's just incredible to watch i mean they're, they're operating on a totally different level to any tradesman that i've ever had working um at my house so it was just amazing the other thing that really surprised me is the the lack of fussiness because um they cut everything right first time every time so there's no oh this needs a little bit of you know this needs a little bit planed off mm. it they, they do it in a way that you know it's so time efficient um it's just so impressive and I learned so much just having them here and watching them. I didn't really do anything. I didn't really get my hands dirty in any way because when he said he was coming over, I assumed it was just going to be him and I was going to be sort of making cuts for him throughout the day and stuff. But it wasn't like that at all. It was um, if I'd have got involved, I would have just slowed them down. Do you know mm. what I mean? So I yeah. would have been a hindrance because I don't really know what I'm doing when it comes to 
roof structural timber work so um i just spent the day making coffees and teas sweeping up and filming and i tell you what i really enjoyed the filming aspect as well i've already had a look through some of the footage and edited it together and it looks like a skill builder video so i need to kind of find my own style in uh how i put that video together but yeah it should be good that's interesting because i bet you've not really filmed when you're not behind the camera filming exactly. other people work and it's really enjoyable when you're filming someone else yeah, I, I think I've said it before. Is the trouble is I love woodworking and I love filming, mm. but doing both together, you're just n- not doing either a hundred percent how you want to, and that's frustrating. Yeah. It's going to be a video, is it? This it's going to be two videos for me, and I think one for Robin. I'm going to do a video focusing on all of the background of the roofing stuff, planning permission, all of that kind of stuff, and then the leak. Um, Mm. So that's going to be kind of like a roofing nightmares video. And then the second part is obviously going to be the flat roof to pitch roof conversion. But I'm kind of going to leave it to Robin to do the whole tutorial thing. I want to push people to the direction of his channel to look because he's going to know all of the technical terms and all of the stuff you need to know if you were doing that work yourself. So I'm just going to do some kind of footage of them working. But I'm just going to say, you know, go and watch Robin's video because that's where you're really going to learn what's happening here kind of thing and if you end up doing the making good that could be a video as well follow up that's a good point actually yeah i hadn't thought of that but to follow up those two i think would people would be interested to see how you fix the that's a good idea problem yeah we used c24 timber to build this roof I've, i'd never used c24 before because obviously it's a bit more expensive than your standard c16 stuff i was pretty impressed actually it, i wouldn't say it was tight grained it, it's not your kind of slow growth timber that you sometimes see but it's much better quality than c16 you can tell mm. um and, and robin was really pleased with it as well actually i had a conversation with him when he first arrived which was quite funny robin does this thing where he will constantly kind of guess things so throughout the day he kept saying so it's about 2.15 at the moment. And he, he's not looked at the time, but you look at your watch and he's like within two minutes of that time. So it's almost like he's got this inbuilt clock in his head. And one of the conversations we had was around this C24 timber. And I kind of said, so how, how much did you think all of that cost? And he got it within 50 pence. <laughs> <laughs> he said 400 pounds. And I said it was 400 pounds and 49 pence. The total bill for that it's just like he just knows <laughs> it's just unbelievable yeah i mean he's designing his own app as well with all of the um roof calculations so mm. that you can basically plug in a few dimensions and it'll give you the measurements you need to cut to, to to avoid having to get your calculator out and trigonometry and all of that i mean my head's just hurting you explaining that <laughs> um i did use a sheet goods calculator actually yeah this week i never use those so how does that work because i've always done it in a very um maybe it's not such a clunky way actually but i've always just drawn up a sheet of plywood on SketchUp Mm. and then literally drawn out my cuts and then that way you can change the um portrait or landscape Mm. and, and kind of figure it out that way and plan out my cuts so how does a cut calculator work is that an online thing I, I used it online, but I think there was an app as well. Um, so you put in what material we have. So mine were sheets, so uh, two, four, four long by one, two, two times two. I had, and then you put in all the bits. So I need a bit that's a meter, so a thousand by six hundred or something. I need two of those. Put in all the bits. So it takes you a bit of time to do that. I'd already sketched out. Or wrote a list of all the bits I need. So it's just typing it out. Yeah. Um, what was interesting and confused me at first was there was no units, as in there was no millimeters or inches. And like, oh, it must need to know. And then I realised it doesn't matter as long as the size of the sheet and the size of the bit you need are in the same yeah. thing. So that was my stupid moment. Anyway, you put it all in. And then it kind of does a calculation and you can almost see the shapes moving around. So it shows you visually as well. It shows you you visually. Yeah. uh, And different colours for different sizes. So if you've got loads of bits all the same size, they're all in 
I don't know, pink or something. Nice. And it's got all the bits written on it. And yeah, it made it easier. That sounds cool. It's, you just want to minimise wastage, especially with material costs, don't you? Yeah, big time. Yeah. And it meant I had pretty much half a sheet left intact, which is really usable, isn't it? Rather than little scraps here and there. Yeah. As I'd have probably cut them different, which would have meant I'd have had less cuts. Yeah. So easier to do, but I also had less usable material left over. Does it ca- take into account kerf and things like that as well? Oh, I don't know. There probably is an option to do it, but... yeah. All I was doing is that was the rough idea of like, I need that bit out of there. And as soon as you got that bit, then yeah. you remeasure, which means you're taking into account the exactly yeah. the curve yourself. Um, maybe if it was much tighter. Yeah, or if you're making literally hundreds of cuts to a to a, to one sheet where you know the curve would stack up. Yeah, where's my iPad? I can do, get it, and then people can look it up. Cutlistoptimizer.com. Right. Oh, yeah, no, cut blade thickness. It's got that as a parameter. Awesome. So I was just using it online, but I think they have an app. I don't think I cared in the past when a sheet of something was 16 quid. Yeah. But now you're paying 40 quid, like, oh. (laughs) Hello, Matt here. It takes us quite a lot of time to prepare and produce each episode of this podcast, and we'd like to keep putting it out for free. If you enjoy the podcast and you'd like to help support and shape future episodes, you can find a link to our Patreon page in the show notes or just search online for Workshop Banter Patreon. Thank you, and now back to the podcast. That wasn't my only collab either. A couple of weeks before, Stuart from Proper DIY got in touch about um, needing a second pair of hands to lift up some timber up onto the top of his barn to build the roof. I said, yeah, of course, you know, that sounds great. So I spent the day with Stuart. Uh, when I arrived, it was like, come into my workshop, we'll sit down, we'll we'll go through some ideas. And it's like, well, this is very professional kind of thing. And he, seeing how he almost storyboards his videos. So mm. kind of like, I've got these three ideas for sketches that we can do throughout the day, like little comedy moments kind of thing in the video. And it, and I found that hugely inspirational as well because it's like, you know, I, I saw how much effort he puts into not only doing the project but also making the video entertaining. That's one of the reasons I really like Stuart's videos is because of the, the entertainment factor. So even if I'm not interested in whatever project he's doing, so if he's doing something that I already know about and I don't really feel I need to watch it, I'll watch it anyway because I like his personality and I like the kind of comedy that he puts into his, his videos. Yeah, that's interesting. I. I do, I guess, sometimes think about um, bits. I often think about how I'm starting the video because I find that the most difficult bit, how to introduce the project. But then I kind of feel, oh, I just make it up as I go along. It seems Mm. to just flow after that. And you hope something interesting happens. Yeah. I mean, in a video series, your roof leaking is TV gold, isn't it? As awful as it is for you, mm. if you're in someone else's house filming for a DIY show, you'd love that. That's that's kind of the end of the show or the or just before the ad break, you would show... It's the hook yeah. and tease, isn't it, to get people to come back and watch more? Yeah, and unfortunately, thumbnails and video titles with anything negative in them tend to do much better than any other video. So I, I yeah. remember that vlog video out, I put out where I, I'd been scammed. That video absolutely banged. It was immediately one out of ten on my uh, performers list. And it's like, you know, it's a bit depressing in a way that the only way you can get people to watch your videos is to have some kind of disaster. So a picture of you holding a bucket on a leaky roof going, (laughs) this is when it all went wrong. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's depressing, but not not, I made this nice thing. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. I really liked your boot bench project, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, those doing the mortise and tenons were just, this is back before, I did this before I had the job. So it's nice to have the weeks where you can go, I can push myself and try something. And yeah, doing it with the drill and the, the bandsaw. And I'd never done it that way. And you know, we think, oh, well, I've got enough time for when I mess it up to do it again. Hmm. But everyone was fine. Everything looked so neat and tidy with your joinery. Um, whenever I've used Forstner bits to drill out mortises before, 
it's just been a little bit messy, but I think that's because you took the time to set up your pillar drill table and yeah. get it drilling exactly where you want to. You've got good repeatability. I, I thought it was fantastic the way that you put that together. Well, and clever camera angles to not show the mess. But, <laughs> uh, I've seen people do uh, tests, though, on mortise and tenons where you've got absolute kind of one of these fine woodworkers that is just perfectly flat everything and then something a bit more rough and the rough joints are actually stronger because they have more kind of glue surface so places for the glue to grip yeah onto, kind of thing. oh that's interesting but i think if you took apart you know classic high-end furniture they would not be absolutely beautiful joints no it's just got to work hasn't it yeah that's it but no i was happy with that and i would do it i would definitely do that again it was much quicker than i imagined to do it all I mean, most of the time was taking a extremely heavy bandsaw and pillar drill out to the workshop just so I could film it, <laughs> which is, I'm, hope, I'm hoping I won't do that again now until um, I build the workshop. Is it on the horizon then? Is it is it looming soon? Uh, I don't want to be outside building it in January, February. I might get the base done. Yeah. But it's also the the money thing. I should have the money by Christmas if I can keep continue working a few nights a week. Yeah. And then I can do it. I've taken a, a bit of a kind of a pay cut, I suppose, moving to this house, as in I used to sell items I made, mm. but I just can't have machinery running solidly for three hours in the tent. It's just yeah, unfair. People always worry about noise, but like making these A-frames, I've had the saws running for an hour all week. It's not huge amounts of noise and it's mm. during the day. So I just can't produce products to sell. But as soon as I build a workshop, I could go back to doing that, which means yeah. maybe I don't have to work in a kitchen. I think I'm going to get sick of it pretty quickly. Really? Well, at the moment, I'm doing two full-time jobs. I did over 30 hours last week. Really? Yeah. Considering I was thinking I was working a full-time job, because I did work seven days a week, mostly on the woodworking. Yeah. So suddenly to put a nix for 30 hours on. My God. But it's gonna, if it gets me the workshop, that is, it's nice to go to a job and go this shift is going to pay for the door or something yeah. and you, you can get yourself through it by doing that and the other motivation is i've moved to this town i don't know anyone in the town wednesday night we went to a couple of pubs and played some pool and stuff so it's nice to meet people and go out yeah so is it just you and one other chef at the moment is, is there anyone else in the kitchen with you guys or is it just you two uh i've got three teenage boys yep Three 17-year-olds. One of them's going to college to be a carpenter. Wow. Yeah. The other two are doing A-levels. I think one's film studies, so we've been discussing. They're all really nice. Yeah. And I thought, oh, what am I going to talk to 17-year-old boys about? But they're all really nice lads, and we have a nice oh, bit awesome. of nice little chat and a bit of a joke, so it's good. Yeah, I've enjoyed your videos recently. I really liked the log store. I liked that the felt didn't work out for you. And you had to use the wrinkly tin. The aesthetic is very much my style, mm. kind of rustic and a bit old fashioned looking. And your paneling, I really liked that because obviously I'd been doing some paneling, but I love, I forgot what you called it, but the, like the shelf at the top of the paneling, that's lovely. I can't take any credit for the design of, of anything to do with that project, really. It was one of those, um, they send you a picture from pinterest or wherever of course we want this so it's like oh you know i can do that kind of thing and your brother has the same taste and color schemes as you do it seems that way <laughs> i think it's very on trend at the moment as i've painted my bathroom and the bedroom both in kind of dark foresty greens yeah i don't know it's such a relaxing color green isn't it, it without is. being cold yeah I've, i think i read something about it being um good for your mental health as well because it's associated with nature and life and things I think like that. so yeah do you know the name I, I imagine you do what a green woodworker is officially called when you say green do you mean sort of wet wood yeah kind of freshly like, cut yeah no no idea a bodger really yeah because obviously it's a bodger word workshop. yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a word we all know but i never knew the the no. meaning of it that's cool. So for people of our generation, they will have watched um, Bodger and Badger. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I've got a kind of a bodgering project because I've been cutting down some conifers 
you couldn't get to the bottom of the garden without kind of brushing through them so they had to go so I'm going to use some of that wood and do some green woodworking and I'm I don't need it isn't for no purpose apart from the fact I'm interested in doing it just something new to get your teeth into yeah and I can't remember the last time I did a project like that so that excites me and it looks like you've been doing the same you've been doing bits for family or Mm. log stores that you need or roofing yeah Do do you have anything coming up that's just for your own enjoyment I've got to be honest my main motivation for changing it up this summer is because I know that furniture projects on YouTube and general woodworking things do so badly during the summer so Mm. this summer I've entirely focused on outdoor things and more carpentry style jobs and to be honest I I get as much if not more enjoyment out of carpentry jobs than I do out of I'm not I'm not gonna say fine woodworking because I wouldn't ever call myself a fine woodworker if you know what I mean I don't think I'm that good but there are a lot of things that I'm really excited about doing at some point in the future but the unfortunate thing is that none of them are feasible for example I always watch the sawmill style videos that Matt Cremona does Mm. and I would love to get into to milling on that scale but obviously I don't have the space for that I would also love to get a vintage, almost derelict caravan and do it up Yeah. from, you know, and turn it into something beautiful. You know, I would so love to do that. Um, when I did the camper van project for friends of ours, or when when I started it anyway, it never, never got completed by me, unfortunately. I was so into that, but because I couldn't do the work on my own, I found it quite stressful. So if I could get a caravan and do it up just on my own i would love to do that but again no space Mm. i would probably have to rent some space somewhere to store the caravan because our driveway is quite small there's no way we could fit a caravan on it the bar i'm working at they've got a garden like a courtyard and they want like an outside cocktail bar for the summer cool so i was like what you need is a converted horse box yeah I was like, they're so cool. I'd love to get one of those old horse boxes where you fold down the flap and it's a cocktail bar. Are they the ones with the kind of arched roof? Am I thinking of the right thing? Uh, I don't know if they're an arched roof. They're kind of almost triangular shape. They kind of taper in at the front. But there's there's hundreds of festivals that people have turned into little coffee uh kiosks or cocktail bars or burger vans or something because they're because the back obviously folds down so you can get a horse in so you've got loads of access that way and then you normally have a hatch at the side to serve from yeah and then you can lock it up at night so you can keep all your booze in there it's like ah if we can get one and i could convert it that would just be that would be awesome i would love to do that i don't think they're gonna because it costs a lot of money but i've always wanted to do one but i've had no reason yeah. To do one. I mean, it's a bit like a shepherd's heart, but they're significantly smaller. Yeah. An Airstream would be cool as well. Oh, an Airstream would be cool. <laughs> Andy Rules, who I watched, the, the Texan mm. chap, he's done one. And I think he got it like four years ago going, got it at the beginning of the year, like, I'll have this ready for the summer. And four years later, he's just finished it. So <laughs> much work. But it's beautiful. They're expensive as well. I mean, I don't know. Like, I imagine in this country, a, a, a terrible condition one is like 30 grand. Yeah. I mean, I'd love a canal boat. I mean, that's how I got into shepherd's huts because I, yeah. I loved small living spaces and canal boats. I've thought about it so many times. Like, could I live on a canal boat? And it's just the workshop. But I do follow a couple of people that run like craft businesses. But it's easier to be sewing and put away your sewing machine yeah. than your than your band saw. Yeah, why can't we have hobbies that take up little storage space? I know. I I do find the bigger the project, the more satisfying it is somehow. Yeah. I don't know why that is. Especially when I sold, used to sell things, I'd love to make things that could go in a post box. Yeah. Uh, and not have to wait in for couriers. You just drop them in a post box at the end of the day. But literally, apart from a bottle opener, I could think of nothing to make. Yeah. And I wasn't even really interested in those. I don't know, everything I want to make is reasonably big. Yeah. There's something about doing a quick project that you get that level of satisfaction of having completed it, but without, you know, 
wasting so many hours into it. I think, to be honest, that might have been one of the appeals for Robin coming to help me up with this roof because he said when he got here, you know, we've we've been working on so many large scale projects recently that the thought of just throwing a pitch roof together in a day just you could tell he was excited by it. Yeah, yeah. It is nice just to get something finished, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I made those stalls slash sawhorses, and that was oh, like... they were brilliant. ...a few hours' work, and it's like a two-and-a-half-minute video or something, but yeah, having someone to sit in the workshop just occasionally, and I've actually just brought some material in, and I used them just to put the materials on this week, and it's like, they could be so useful, and they take up no room. The simplest ideas are sometimes the best aren't they i mean yeah. I, there's so many times throughout projects i'm working on when i'm looking around for somewhere to to put something and everything's just covered in tools and debris mm. and i don't really want to clear things up so to be able to have something that you can just pull out and perch things on yeah and abuse as in if mm. you wanted to paint things on it and get covered in paint well they cost 20 quid to make yeah but hopefully this time next year if we're still talking to each other or be recording the podcast in a new workshop. Yeah. We're we're salvaging all of the old roof tiles to sell on because some of them are decent enough to sell. So I made a little ramp so that we can go from the scaffolding leading down to the skip so that my wife can reluctantly scooch them down to me and then I can pile them up and sort them all out, throw away the bad ones. So what, are you going to pallet them all up? I've just been stacking them up in our garden. Um, putting them on pallets would have been a good idea, but I, I'd already cut up all my pallets for firewood. <laughs> I suppose pallets are only useful if someone turns up with a forklift as well, aren't they? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, apparently these tiles are only worth 25p each. Really? But when you think about, you know, we've got well over 1,000, that's 250 quid, which yeah. every little helps, really. Well, because... And you'd have to pay to dispose of them. Well, I don't think so, because obviously I think the skip and everything has been factored in with the roofer's costs. Right. But yeah, we're just trying to get the bill down as much as we possibly can, because it, obviously it's thousands and thousands of pounds to do the work that we're yeah. doing, and we can't really afford it. And it fits with our ethos. Why throw it away that something is perfectly... Usable. Usable, yeah. yeah. I imagine this is the biggest thing you need to do on the house, so I'm sure you're mm. going to be so pleased when it's done. And I know you don't want to move, but these mm. things do add value to the house as well, don't they? Yeah, I think the roof should outlast us. I think apparently the lifespan of a clay roof tile is 60 years, so mm. I'm already 40, so that's that's me, me gone. <laughs> well, I want to do my flat roof. In fact, this morning was the first morning i've got up and walked out into the kind of kitchen bathroom bit which is the flat roof and going oh it's chilly in here yeah and what we mid september it's like ah if i can work at this place until at least spring next year i can probably pay for a a warm roof as well yeah is that a job you think you might consider tackling yourself well it's weird my biggest fear is i don't think it's technically difficult laying the rubber membrane i did that in the summer it's yeah. not hard what terrifies me is ripping the roof off the house and having it exposed yeah as i think if i got people in i reckon they'd rip it off in the morning the afternoon what laying down some sheets of uh insulation board putting some osb or ply on top and put it i reckon they'd have it done in a day yeah you're probably and, right. and come back maybe the next day to do the uh, soffit boards and guttering mm. and things but basically it'd be watertight by the end of the day and and I think the trouble with what me doing is you don't know what you need a lot of the time until you rip the roof off yeah yeah if I had a couple of friends locally maybe I'd go we'll get it done yeah because I reckon it's probably only a grand in materials I can always come over if you ever want to do a project like that I'd be yeah. happy to help well it would be interesting to film but also if I was doing it myself, I probably wouldn't film it because it's, as you know, it takes twice as much time. Have you got any new tools since we spoke last or anything new in the workshop? I do, actually. Um, and I'm contemplating actually doing a video about two new tools that I have. Obviously, because of all of the roofing work that's been going on, I haven't had too much time to put into projects. <clears throat> Saying that, I did do one project. I did finish one project last week, which I was really pleased with and... I knew I have a new favourite timber. Ooh. <laughs> My mum and dad acquired this old garden bench 
that was really weathered and worn and dirty and rickety and the joinery was pretty bad they kind of asked me can you know can you sand it down and make it look pretty it's like well I can but it's rubbish (laughs) it needs more than that um even down to the depth of the seat that you sit on isn't deep enough so it was quite uncomfortable to sit on the the back rest wasn't really angled enough so you're kind of sitting upright it was just it needed complete rehash so I said I'll make a brand new frame for it and I'll plane down the the slats that are on it currently and reuse them that was the plan first thing I did when I got it into the workshop is just ran a block plane over it just to see what the timber was underneath I planed the side and I thought oh that's a lot darker than I thought it looks like it could be a roco, which is a wood that I've worked with before it's really good for outdoor use because it's quite an oily hardwood but I kind of thought to myself it might be teak it might be real teak and uh, I don't know how familiar you are with teak um, but I've read up on it a few times and it basically only grows in very few countries and it's a really sort of hard to come by thing and that makes it really expensive so I started looking into the differences between teak and Oroco and um, apparently when you mill up teak it gives off a very leathery smell okay so anyway I did the whole project I made a hardwood frame for it out of some scraps of Moranti and mahogany and various woods that I had in the hardwood store already then it was time to mill down the slats ran them through the planer and I got this leathery smell. I was like, oh wow, this could be real teak. And then when I oiled it up with some um, teak oil, oh my God, the grain on this timber was just shimmering and it just looked absolutely beautiful. Yeah, I fell in love with it. And then it got to a point where I finished the bench, took it around to my mum and dad and I didn't really want to part with it. (laughs) I was like, I really really want this in my garden. So you got them to change the wheel and leave you the bench in it. (laughs) Yeah, I just want the bench incredibly beautiful timber to work with um very oily to the touch as well so when you plane it down you run your finger over it and it feels so smooth and it's kind of got a wetness to it um but yeah it's beautiful uh, whether it actually is teak or not in fact i'm looking forward to putting the video out because i'm sure i'll get some comments saying nah that's a roco and then some other comments saying that's definitely teak and then i won't be any of the wiser anyway but it um, sounds like it if, if the smell that's what i thought yeah you have to see if you like got a local boatyard because like all the deck boards on nice boats are all teak and things. Mm. So I bet they rip them all off, but they're all long, thin strips. So if it's time you put them through the plane, I bet they come out beautifully. I bet, yeah. You could use them, but everyone else just probably yeah. burns them. Right, should we do like a recommendation? Last time we spoke, I didn't have a recommendation, which was unusual for me. Um, oh, how many this time? <laughs> I've got two... Do you want to go first? Oh, well, that's very kind of you. I have Jasper Makes. No, it's not Jasper. It's Jesper. J-E-S-P-E-R. Have you watched, I think he's the Australian guy, I forgot his name, but um, DIY for Knuckleheads? Yes. This is titled The Knuckleheads Reclaim Workbench. So he makes that chap's workbench but he's featured in the video they have a phone call in it it's a very simple build but there's lots of humor in it and genuinely made me laugh and it's a well-produced video and he looks like he's doing okay he's got 82,000 subs and this video has had 364,000 views I'm already subscribed I think I've watched one or two of his videos in the past he's done incredibly well because he's only got a handful of videos and most of them are shorts but yeah I definitely watch this video is uh, very entertaining and using all reclaimed materials, so on on brand. Go on then. So the first one is one of my favourite YouTube channels. I watch all of his videos, but he makes a real mixture of content, things like foraging. Occasionally he'll make things. Sometimes he'll do woodworking. Sometimes he'll do videos about scam baiting scammers and things like that. It's a channel called Atomic Shrimp um, by a guy called Mike. Uh, He does a lot of cooking as well, but he made a video, it was a few weeks ago now, it's called Can I Make Stained Glass Panes from Sea Glass or Beach Glass? So basically he goes walking on the beach and he finds little segments of glass and he finds a way to um, basically replace the panes of glass in this lamp with beach glass, which beach glass just looks good, doesn't it? It's it's smooth, it's kind of, it just looks cool. 
And he made this stunning lamp out of it. I mean, it's a long video. I think it's the best part of an hour. Um, but I really enjoyed it. It's fantastic because you, you see all of the mistakes he makes and how he overcomes them. And he finds ways to kind of join them together using copper tape and solder. It's just really cool. And the end result was fantastic. But yeah, one of my favourite channels. So aside from that particular video, his other videos are brilliant as well, I think. That's interesting, these channels that are all over the place. And clearly you're watching the videos because you like him and you like his style rather than yeah. any subject. Yeah. The next one is a TikTok chap called Kerry Pierce. Um, he does a lot of wood carving, really ornate looking bird boxes, kind of faces. And he's just a really good sculptor. But he's also a really good personality. So his persona comes across in his videos. So he's just a really good guy to watch. So yeah, that's Kerry Pierce. Thank you for listening. You can find Keith on YouTube by searching for Rag N Bone Brown and me by searching for Badger Workshop. We have a Patreon page if you'd like to help support us in making future episodes of the podcast. Link to that in the show notes. And we have a Workshop Banter Instagram and Facebook page if you'd like to get in touch, which is at Workshop Banter, all one word.